Thank you for joining us for this evening's program on Iran. Our distinguished guests this evening are Ben and Ben Talablu, Michael Singh, and moderator Greg Dobbs. I'm Claire Noble, the Director of Programming for the Vail Symposium. On behalf of Chris Sable, our Executive Director, Dale Mosier, our Board Chairman, and the entire Vail Symposium Board, welcome. The Vail Symposium has been convening locally and thinking globally since 1971. Two items to be aware of before we get started, please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for tonight's speakers. We'll get to those questions later in the program and we'll get to as many as time permits. Tonight's program will run until 7 p.m. It's being recorded and you'll be able to find that recording at veilsymposium.org. I'd like to thank the organizations and individuals who've helped make tonight's program possible. Our sponsors include the Town of Vail, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, The Antlers at Vail, and The Vail Daily. Our virtual programs are sponsored by Alpine Bank. Jeannie and Dale Mosier have underwritten the winter season, and the geopolitical series is underwritten by Cindy Ingalls. The Vail Symposium is also supported by a generous grant from the Frechette Family Foundation. Thank you to all of our donors. As many of you are now aware, Eagle County is experiencing Yet another surge of the COVID pandemic with a positivity rate now greater than 25% and our local hospital under tremendous strain. Therefore, we've postponed our next two scheduled programs for later this spring. Our next program will be on Tuesday, January 11th. It will be a webinar on special districts, the most local of local government. And then on Thursday of that week, January 13th, we welcome behavioral scientist Michelle Gelfand. This was to be in person, but it will be a webinar now. She's a behavioral scientist with Stanford University and author of Rule Makers, Rule Breakers, How Tight and Loose Cultures Wire Our World. Tonight's program focuses on the fraught relations between the United States and Iran. Tonight's program moderator is Greg Dobbs, a journalist for almost 50 years, including roughly two decades as a foreign and war correspondent for two American television networks, primarily ABC. He provided news coverage in more than 80 countries, particularly throughout the Middle East and Russia, as well as coverage of the US space program. Greg hosted Colorado State of Mind for six years for Rocky Mountain PBS. He's the winner of three Emmy Awards and the Distinguished Service Award from the Society of Professional Journalists. In 2017, Greg was inducted into the Denver Press Club Hall of Fame. Just one last reminder to please use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. And I'll turn the program over to Greg Dobbs. Thank you, Claire, and good evening. Although right now, uh, Russia and China seem to get most of our attention, Iran is still a flashpoint, a very dangerous flashpoint in American foreign policy. And that's why we're having this symposium tonight. We'll get inside about Iran's nuclear program and efforts, at least from our point of view, to mitigate it, and as well as uh, Iran's unceasing support for some of our most hostile adversaries. We have two of the nation's leading Iran experts to take us through all this. Ben, ben Am Taliblu is senior fellow at uh, Foundation for Defense of Democracies. And because of his expertise, he's been on everything from C-SPAN to CBS to Fox News. He's been quoted in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. Ben Am was born in New York, but his parents came from Iran. And his work has always been the analysis of Iran, which I can tell you firsthand as a reporter who has spent a good piece of time there myself is no easy thing. And just so you know, he is multi-talented. When Ben Am is not collecting information about Iran, he is collecting cookbooks and ancient recipes. He told me he's a giant foodie. Our other guest is Michael Singh. Michael was former special counsel or assistant to secretaries of state Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell. And then in the second half of the uh, second term of George W. Bush, he was senior director for the Middle East at the National Security Council. And ever since then, he has also focused on Iran. Michael's writing has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times. He's also been all over TV from CNN to Fox. And here's an unusual anecdote about Mike. He didn't grow up as a little boy saying, I wanna focus on Iran. He actually went to college on a scholarship in astrophysics, believe it or not, but somewhere along the way shifted from 
watching the universe to watching the Middle East. I would guess the universe would have been easier. Now to tonight's program, the subject, the title is Bad Blood. Will the US and Iran ever get along? And I can't think of a better place to start than by asking a question framed by that title. Will the US and Iran ever get along? And let's start in alph alphabetical order with you, Ben Alm. Apologies for that delay, I was unmuting myself. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's great to be with you. Thank you to everyone at the Vail Symposium for virtually hosting us. And, and, and many thanks to Michael for uh, once again elsewhere sharing the virtual stage with me. Uh, it, it really is a pleasure. I think you know a very short answer uh, is yes, but to borrow from, uh, uh, I think it was Tybalt or Mercutio in, in uh, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, where he says, I will be brief, and then launches into a five, six page monologue. The answer is yes, Iran and America can in fact get along. I do believe that if you believe in something called forces of history, uh, that they could in fact get along. But that is not the Islamic Republic of Iran. That is the nation of Iran, the Iranian people. Um, if you take it by the regime name and the regime type, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the current supreme leader of that country, who is in the eighth decade of his life and the third decade of his career as supreme leader, and, and as we know, that's a title meant to be taken rather literally in the Islamist autocracy that is the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, you know, he has had some views on this, and he's pretty intent. He calls America the great Satan. He calls America a deal breaker. Uh, he calls America the global arrogance. These are all, you know, shorthand slurs in the Islamic Republic's political parlance, in their lexicon, what they like to call the United States. Khamenei needs enmity. Khamenei, Ali Khamenei is Iran's supreme leader. That's his first and last name. And he needs enmity with America. And he's actually talked about analysis of Iran in D.C. several years ago, asking this very question, in fact, answering this very question, that Iran and America can get along, but the Islamic Republic of Iran and America cannot get along. And what he's done at the helm of that country for the past three decades is make sure structurally, bureaucratically, politically, militarily, and most importantly, ideologically, to make sure that that chasm between these two great nations continues to exist. Michael. Thanks a lot, Greg. And let me just say first, uh, it's a pleasure to be with everyone on this call. It's been about five years since uh, I was last at the Vail Symposium. I spoke on this same topic actually in March of 2016 in person. And that was right after the nuclear deal came into force. And so we're uh, at a very different place now than we were then. But actually, I think some of the problems that we're seeing now are ones that maybe we foresaw back then and we talked about a little bit back then. Um, I wish I could be with everyone in person again. I, I wore my best sort of Alpine Christmas sweater to make it feel like I'm in Vail, but, uh, but I'm missing the snow and the mountains and everything else. And of course, all of you. Um, and I hope everyone will say hello to my friend Dale Mosier for me uh, if he's not on the call listening. But, um, you know, can the U.S. and Iran get along? In many ways, Greg, I think that the question itself is, is not the right question because, you know, countries... Um, sometimes get along, sometimes don't, but countries don't really have friends. We don't have, you know, uh, that kind of relationship in foreign policy. You know, you can even see between the U.S. and, and France recently, there was a, a bit of a blow up over our uh, submarine deal with the Australians, which the French were unhappy about because it voided their own deal with the Australians and they withdrew their ambassador from Washington. Um, and we had a, a bit of a, a kerfuffle. We, we have those with our friends. We have uh, bigger ones, obviously, with adversaries. Um, I agree with what Vietnam said, uh, but it's important to remember that even a, a democratic Iran um, would not, wouldn't necessarily sort of be problem free for the United States. Um, there are other influences inside Iran uh, that are strongly um, sort of anti-Western that, that might not see alliance with the United States or alliance with any great power as, as being in Iran's interest. Um, but really, we don't need to get along with Iran. We don't need to be friends. Um, what we need is for Iran not to threaten our interests. Um, and Iran's pursuit of nuclear weapons, its activities around the Middle East, directly threaten American interests. And, and that really is what we need to stay focused on. If, if I, I agree with Vietnam that um, those things flow from the ideology uh, of the regime in Iran, they flow from uh, other domestic factors inside Iran. But if it weren't for those things, we could safely ignore Iran. And frankly, that would be fine. 
Um, so we could get along, but we don't need to get along. We just need Iran to stop threatening our interests, and then we can then we can move on to other problems. Well, that said, let me reframe the question you, because you make a terrific point. Can the U.S. and Iran ever find common ground on nuclear weapons, on support for terrorism, and any other issues that are out there? Well, maybe I'll maybe I'll start. You know, it's an, again an interesting question because you can look at. Uh, American adversaries around the world, China, Russia. And oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, look, we have some overlapping interests. China needs oil. We need oil. Um, we both, in, in theory, have an interest in, for example, a stable Middle East. Both the United States and China have an interest in combating terrorism because both of our countries uh, have experienced terrorist attacks of, of different sorts. And yet that cooperation ultimately is elusive. And, and the reason it tends to be elusive is um, number one, uh, priorities. So oftentimes with China, for example, we may have some overlapping interests, but China's priority uh, is to uh, gain in strength vis-a-vis um, -vis the United States. And so they're not always necessarily looking, in fact, I should say they're, they're rarely looking for win-win solutions. They're looking for ways to gain advantage against the United States. Um, the other issue that prevents us from cooperating when we have overlapping interests is we often pursue those interests in very different ways. Um, and so if you look at um, even something as simple as counterterrorism, the way we would fight terrorism and the way that China or Iran or Russia fight terrorism are very, very different. And so finding that common ground, even though we might all agree that terrorism is a problem, uh, is, is not so easy. I think in the case of Iran, um, what you'll find is that Iran's fundamental strategy uh, under its current government, its current leadership, um, is really designed to, number one, um, push the United States back because they see the United States as a major threat in the region, um, a threat which, frankly, is a, of a bigger scale than other threats uh, that they face in the region. So they consider the United States their chief adversary, I would say, in the Middle East, not Saudi Arabia, not Israel. Um, and so that's really their top priority. Um, and it takes precedence over those other smaller issues on, on which we uh, might, on paper, uh, be able to find some agreement. And, and even if it didn't, I, I think we would find that the, the methods and tactics that are used by Iran uh, are not ones that would sit well with us. We're not going to um, try to stabilize the Middle East by uh, doing the types of things that uh, Iran is interested in doing. Um, if you look at, for example, the way the United States has fought ISIS, and then the way that Iran has fought ISIS, oftentimes in the very same places, uh, they look quite different. Um, Iran tends to do things in a way that ultimately undermine the sovereignty of states like Iraq or Syria or Lebanon. The United States tries, not always successfully, uh, to pursue strategies which actually bolster or strengthen the sovereignty uh, of these states and strengthen the control of the central government of these states over, say, the military apparatus and so forth. So even if you could identify those shared interests, um, and I realize we're getting off to a sort of bleak start here in, in the description of the problem, but it is a serious problem. Um, it would be very tough to find areas of cooperation. Well, Ben Am, if we talk about the bleak problem, the bleakest of all problems is the possibility of a nuclear Iran. The question is this, the Vienna talks have been restarted. It's fair to say that they have not, and this is not meant to be a pun and it's a very bad one, but they have not set the world on fire which means there is a possibility they, that we don't succeed in mitigating the threat of a nuclear Iran and that, nu that Iran then proceeds to ramp up its production. How bad could things get between the United States and Iran if that's the case? And to take it a little further, uh, how long could it take to get that bad? Oh boy. Uh <laughs> You know, much of the literature behind me is uh, is history. It, it, it's aimed at trying to discover the past. Now we've got to project forward. Uh, unfortunately, that's not a strong suit of mine, but I'll do my best to draw on the, the strands and strains we have from history, uh, no matter uh, how old or how recent. You know, I think in 2021, the United States of America, and this is just my view, uh, did itself no favors vis-a-vis -vis the direction of Iran's nuclear program. Uh, you know, the Biden administration, which came in in January, like many other administrations that came in, both during the campaign period and during the early few months uh, that they come in and they transition into power, sought to draw for domestic political reasons, as well as for foreign policy and structural reasons, a sharp contrast with the inherited legacy uh, of its predecessor. Uh, 
But the problem is, you know, America's authoritarian adversaries, be it in places like Russia, China, you know, TPRK in Pyongyang, for instance, uh, or Iran, they've grown more attuned to these different oscillations from the left to the right or center left, center right, or, you know, far left, far right in American foreign and security policy. It's a, it's a cliche to say that the authoritarian adversaries speak with the same hyperbole uh, about America's motivations for certain actions or certain moves, given how public America's domestic politics have been really in the last decade, and given how vitriolic uh, our domestic politics have become and the implications of those politics. So I think Iran was in a cheap position to exploit this. You know, the Biden administration cannot be uh, you know, accused of not trying to do everything diplomatically in 2021. From, I mean, in my view, bending over backwards in the region, you know, repealing terrorist designations of groups that are partners or proxies of the Islamic Republic that literally act like terrorists on a daily basis. The Houthis in Yemen, which use child soldiers, abuse journalists, repress minorities, and fire long-range strike capability systems like drones and ballistic missiles and cruise missiles at civilian population centers. You know, having that entity removed from the terror list did no one did no one any benefit in Washington as a signal of American resolve. There's long been questions about American staying power in the region. And there's long been questions about, you know, when multiple American presidents have come up there on the left or on the right saying that they will seek to prevent a nuclear armed Islamic Republic of Iran, how genuine are they about that, you know, keeping the military option as it were on the table. And, you know, over the years, Iran and America have sent each other a series of signals and series of impressions. And what you have with the hardened uh, ultra hardline elite now at the helm of the Islamic Republic, both with the new president who came in this August and members of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in the military, uh, as well as the veterans across Iran's politics, these guys are comfortable with contestation and conflict more than other iterations of different factions uh, in Iran's politics. So these guys are more inclined to press on the gas uh, in late 2021 into 2022. And just at the time when America is seeking to draw a contrast and upend its own pressure policy or withhold some of the sanctions that it might have in store or not actively enforce uh, the sanctions that you know, the previous president brought back into force, uh, the people at the helm in Iran are most keen to exploit that, most keen to pocket concessions. And this mismatch is what can cause accidents. This mismatch is what can cause taking advantage of one side from the other at the nuclear negotiating table, uh, and not only not end up in a deal, but end up midwifing something that you don't want, which is a potential Iranian capability to move towards a nuclear weapon, for instance. Um, while it is absolutely true that the Islamic Republic took advantage of the US leaving the nuclear deal that was agreed to in 2015, implemented in 2016, and left by America in 2018, um, took advantage of that to, in 2019, begin to incrementally violate the deal when you look at the scale and the scope of the violations in the past year or year and a half, this is not just me saying it, you have the European powers, the E3, the French, the Germans, uh, and the Brits who believe between the US and Iran that they're the adults in the room. And they are the ones calling this JCPOA, that 2015 nuclear deal, um, you know, saying that its counter proliferation value is increasingly reduced by some of these irreversible and permanent, you know, their words, not mine, nuclear moves that Iran has taken in 2021, trying to capitalize on all of these opportunities, both in the region, you know, in the maritime domain, in the cyber domain, and most definitely in the nuclear domain. So, you know, moving into 2022, I am very worried about the collapse of diplomacy. I am very worried about how serious this talk of a plan B is in America, of, you know, how to move to coercive diplomacy, how to move to pressure, how to multilateralize unilateral pressure. Uh, and I'm worried about each side sending each other the wrong signal. Um, because there's a, there's a saying or there's a phrase in Persian, which means destiny creating gears. And I think 2022, uh, for good or for ill, and I think for ill, uh, on the Iran nuclear file could be a destiny creating year. But between the two of you, you've referred to the, tool, the spectrum of tools the United States has to try to influence Iran's behavior from from, from upping sanctions to dropping missiles. Uh, but in fact, does any of that change Iran's behavior, looking at it from inside Iran? Well, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question, Greg, because we have, on the one hand, for a couple of decades now or more, actually succeeded in preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Now, whether how hard they were trying, whether they'd made the decision to obtain one, uh, is is an important question in that regard. 
Um, on the other hand, uh, as Vietnam said, they have gotten closer and closer, especially over, I would say, the last uh, two years, 2021 and, and 2020. Um, so, so we have, I would say, kind of uh, a, a good story to tell, but then an alarming situation right now. And the, the, the good story to tell is that when we have managed to combine um, serious pressure on Iran, with um, international diplomacy. When I say international diplomacy, I mean diplomacy where you have the United States acting in concert with a coalition of partners. Um, uh, and because that, that when you act with a coalition of partners, it also helps to isolate Iran and put some diplomatic pressure on Iran, which is another type of pressure um, that sometimes we don't uh, talk as much about as we do sanctions pressure. And when you have looming in the background, I would say, a credible military deterrent. In other words, if Iran worries that if it were try to try, if it were to try to cross the nuclear threshold, in other words, produce a nuclear weapon, it might in fact spark a, a military conflict with the United States. When you put those things together, my own view is that yes, um, you can influence the Iranian regime's behavior. Um, if you believe that those things can't influence the regime's behavior, essentially you're saying the regime is irrational. Uh, some people believe that. I actually don't believe that. I think this is a regime that makes cost-benefit decisions, not necessarily the same ones that another government would make or that you and I would make, but it's weighing those costs and benefits. My concern is right now, Iran has made that progress that Vietnam talked about, and it hasn't really perceived too much of a cost for taking those steps. And so there's a certain rationality or logic in continuing to press forward until they find where the limit um, uh, that the United States or the, or the Western powers have might be. Um, we have seen in the past, in say 2003, when Iran paused its nuclear weapons work, um, we've seen in the late 1980s when Iran um, finally ended its war with, uh, with Iraq, um, uh, quite reluctantly, that when Iran deems the pressure against it or the threat against it to be too significant, uh, it will change course. Um, but simply asking it to, simply sort of hoping to persuade it to, uh, without bringing into uh, bear or bringing, bringing to bear all those other tools that we have, I think is not going to work. Is the United States also employing these tools in any way to mitigate Iran's support of our adversaries? As we know, they've supported terrorists in Lebanon and in Syria and in Iraq and in Yemen and the Palestinian territories. From Washington's point, what are we trying to do about that? Because that is no small thing either. Maybe the biggest single threat of Iran is nuclear proliferation, but they keep the chaos going in the Middle East. Uh, should I take a stab at that first or, or uh, Michael first? Ben on. Okay, so I have an analogy or I have, I have imagery related to this because I think U.S. policy has been somewhat more successful, somewhat not successful, depending on how they've attacked these two different problems, right? You mentioned functional problem one, which is the proliferation problem, the nuclear problem, and then functional problem two, which is the, we know what the Iranians call the export of the revolution, or we call, you know, the, their terrorism strategy or their proxy warfare strategy. Uh, and for a long time, number two uh, was the main threat by Iran, you know, right after the revolution uh, in 1979, as you know, Greg, you were covering uh, this revolution and its aftermath. There was the war with Iraq, 1980 to 1988. Uh, as well as, of course, Iran's attempts to co-opt a series of groups uh, in the region. And where it couldn't co-opt groups, it was doing what Mike was talking about, which is rather than work with the state uh, you know, to be a status quo power, it sought to subvert the state uh, through the development of these proxies, these partners, proliferating weapons, creating weapons, creating militia groups. Lebanese Hezbollah, for instance, uh, you know, a terror group in Lebanon created in the early 1980s and amid the Lebanese civil war, allowed Iran to get a platform in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, begin to attack Israel indirectly there. Uh, it's often called the most successful export uh, of the Islamic revolution, you know, creating many Islamic republics uh, around the region in an attempt to upend the US bolstered balance of power in the region. So there, this is the ultimate goal of the Iranians. The Americans know that. Uh, so what have we done about it? Uh, I think when we've been able to merge the nuclear and the regional issues together, we've created more high risk scenarios uh, where things can go wrong on our end and on the Iranians' end. But at least I think we sent the signal that we care about these things together. And, and that's why I think when you contrast that to, you know, prioritizing the nuclear issue and saying, okay, these terrorism issues 
you know, this has been the US MO since 2002, in my view. Most administrations will make the nuclear issue, the, this primo center paris, or, you know, like I say, they'll, they'll take a nuclear uber alles approach, you know, sanctions pressure, diplomatic pressure, multilateral pressure, uh, and, you know, even threatening uh, military force when needed to try to stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. But then that takes up all the oxygen in the room, that takes up all the policymaking creativity out at the room, that takes up all the multilateral consensus that may have existed. Perhaps the Europeans may not be able to pressure Iran on regional issues the way they can on functional issues like uh, you know, non-proliferation, for instance. And so I liken that approach to having a wedding cake on Iran. You have a list of priorities. The more attractive they get to the top is when you have more and more consensus. And I think what was done successfully in the last uh, administration, which, you know, they failed to implement it well, you know, th there could have been better attempts to implement it. But I think what was conceptually more successful uh, and thus at least signal to the Iranians that we're not going to decide between the threats that you pose. We're going to marshal all aspects of American power against the multiplicity of threats coming out of this regime and not rank order them and not prioritize them is to uh, take that multi-tiered wedding cake where you know you have nuclear at the top and just like the top that you save for the next year, uh, that takes all the attention out of the room, you know, but you had terrorism and, and regional and cyber and human rights and democracy promotion, all that, you know, the previous administration, I think, tried to make it into a pancake. And what you would hear from the Europeans is, is that if everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority. So that's why there was challenges with implementing this more, you know, cohesive or comprehensive Iran policy. But I think at least intellectually, that's the right place for policymakers to begin to not sacrifice, you know, Syria policy, counterterrorism policy, maritime smuggling policy, sanctions policy, human rights, democracy promotion policy at, you know, this nuclear altar. I think combining them signals a kind of seriousness to Iran and that, you know, beginning to ask the right questions and seeing the problem the right way will help us solve the problem and have the right answers to those problems. So I think a more comprehensive approach uh, is the way to go, uh, not weigh the nuclear and the regional against one another. That's just my view. But Michael, all that said, do you have a sense that the leadership of each country is willing in negotiations over any of the outstanding issues? And top of the list, of course, is the, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, better known as the nuclear talks, the requirement for concessions, concessions from both sides, because if there aren't concessions from each side, the other side isn't going to agree to a plan. Uh, is there a willingness to make concessions, uh, given that they are very different, very, very dangerous concessions to make from the U.S. point of view and from Iran's? You know, I think if you look at the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, that's the, the 2015 nuclear deal, it would be easy to look at it and say, you know, there's, there's a simple balance here. Uh, Iran made nuclear concessions. The U.S. made sanctions concessions. Uh, and I think that that's wrong, frankly, um, because when you look at what Iran actually received in that 2015 deal, yes, it received economic relief, and that was the main sort of uh, tangible thing the United States offered in the document itself. But there were a couple of other things which um, were more implicit, uh, or at least um, not, not as spoken about, let's say, that Iran got from that 2015 deal. Um, number one, uh, and, you know, most significantly, in a sense, was that the United States uh, and, and not just the United States, the UN Security Council ended its opposition to Iran having enrichment and reprocessing activities. So those core sort of nuclear fuel fabrication technologies on its soil. Uh, we went from saying Iran can't have these activities at all to saying, OK, Iran can have these activities, but they need to be limited and monitored. That is a very significant shift uh, from the point of view of nuclear nonproliferation, because you're going from saying any of these activities, if we detect them, um, are illegal, and it means that Iran is in violation of its obligations, to saying, well, we just have to make sure that they stay within these bounds, which is a hard task uh, and acknowledges that Iran has um, not a right necessarily to these activities. That's what Iran uh, had long claimed, but at least we've, we've conceded that they can do them and we won't oppose it. Number three, beyond the sanctions relief and that key nuclear concession, Iran's nuclear activities gained legitimacy. So previously, Iran's nuclear activities were illegal, they were clandestine, they were pursued uh, in secret. And now suddenly we said, no, in fact, these are legitimate activities. And that has tremendous implications for 
today and for the Trump administration, because when it was trying to oppose those activities, it was no longer as we were in the 2000s or 2010s trying to oppose activity that was internationally recognized as illicit. It was trying to oppose activity that the UN Security Council had in fact blessed. And so that legitimacy for Iran's nuclear program was also a key concession that the United States made. So, so what we had in that 2015 deal was actually a very significant shift in the American position towards Iran, one which probably went further than many Americans realized and which lacked bipartisan support. Uh, and that, in part, is why President Trump withdrew. He also withdrew because of domestic politics. I think we all understand that. And so now when you fast forward to today and these negotiations, well, that legitimacy is not something that you can take away. You know, it's not as though President Trump, by withdrawing from the JCPOA, was able to snatch back that legitimacy that had been conferred on Iran's nuclear activities by the UN Security Council. Um, nor have we been able to retract that um, sort of change in international policy where, whereas, uh, whereby we allowed Iran to conduct these activities on its soil. No one really thinks that Iran is ever going to give up those activities at this point. So those concessions are made. So, so in a sense, you know, Iran has pocketed those things and now is looking to go even further. What they want is they want the United States to not only lift the sanctions specified in the JCPOA, but basically to say that all American sanctions are somehow illegitimate uh, or illegal, uh, going even into the sanctions which address those other aspects of Iranian policy, uh, which we were talking about. Um, so uh, this is kind of a long-winded answer, Greg, to your question. Can both sides make concessions? The United States has made lots of concessions. Um, I would say that Iran um, has made far fewer, frankly, because Iran has managed to emerge from all of this, whether by our mistakes or their own um, savvy, in a sense, um, having experienced a lot of economic difficulty, for sure, something that the regime, I think, uh, has decided is worthwhile for the sake of its nuclear program, but still marching, marching steadily along um, towards that nuclear weapons capability. And I think the, the question or the choice we really have to pose to Iran, uh, which is very difficult today, is between having that nuclear weapons option, that nuclear weapons capability, um, on the one hand, and having the economic relief um, and the sort of integration into the international community on the other. Um, and so far, they've managed to escape that choice. I think of the movie title, Back to the Future. That's where we are. Uh, how about Russia and China? Uh, they're standing somewhere near the door. Uh, on the one hand, they're always looking over their shoulders at Iran with good reason. But on the other hand, uh, consistent with the the, uh, the uh, policy all over the Middle East with which you two are familiar, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So what role, if any, are they playing in the, not only the negotiations, but in uh, trying to persuade Iran to pursue one path or another? Ben Am? Sure, sorry, just unmuting. Uh, you know, it's a very interesting question because I, I think both countries, the, you know, you can call them now America's near peer competitors or America's authoritarian adversaries, Russia and China. Uh, you, when you look at their behavior towards Iran, you know, it's, it's not an alliance per se, uh, but it's an axis. And in a sense, both of these countries, China and Russia, in, in, in different respects, you know, China more economically and then, and then militarily trickle down and, and Russia politically and diplomatically and then militarily and economically trickle down, uh, use Iran uh, as a pawn really uh, in their larger game of strategic competition against America. They will sacrifice Iran, uh, I think, as the, the past two decades of their bilateral relations with Iran show, as well as, of course, their horse trading of the Iran issue with America under Republican and Democratic uh, presidents since the 90s shows. Uh, it's just how far you're willing to push them and how far they're willing to go and how far the Iranians shoot themselves in the foot in their own bilateral approach towards these countries. But ultimately, um, I see Iran in both of their hands in, in the short term as something to as a card to burn, but at the right price and at the right time. You know, the, those tough multilateral uh, penalties that, that Michael was talking about uh, that pre-existed the consensus on Iran having no enrichment and reprocessing that predate the JCPOA, Russia and China were signatories to all of those UN Security Council resolutions that formed the backbone for multilateral pressure on Iran from 2006 to 2010. So when I saw headlines like a few weeks ago, you know, based out of the talks that just restarted in Vienna from November 29th and on, that the Chinese were getting frustrated 
uh, with the Iranians at the negotiating table, because, you know, I think Russia and China certainly don't want Iran to become a nuclear power, but they do want resurrection of that deal, both to bless the expansion of their ties economically, politically, as well as militarily down the line. But, you know, Chinese rhetoric and Chinese reality didn't square to be the same with me. They didn't, they didn't square the circle the same way in the sense that China may be saying in Vienna, it's more critical of Iran or that Iran is dragging its feet or that this is counterproductive or unhelpful in the path to resurrect the JCPOA. But Chinese behavior of increased oil ex imports in 2021 and, and, and different front companies that do everything that is sanctionable under US law when it comes to sale, supply, transfer, ship, refine, and even insure uh, Iranian oil. Uh, you know, that activity has continued. In fact, in some months, uh, it's actually picked up uh, relative to the periods in the past, 2018, 2019. You know, China was the largest licit and illicit. Uh, importer of Iranian oil, both pr prior to and during the Obama era and Trump era sanctions. And I think both countries, Russia and China, will look to use Iran incrementally uh, as kind of a shiv against American policy in the region. Um, and I, I think I'll leave it there. Michael, I used to refer to the president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, he was, I think, two presidents back, as a suicide bomber with a nation strapped to his chest. He seemed like that kind of a leader. Uh, do you sense that today's leaders would be as willing to make their population of tens of millions of people suffer the way he seemed to be, or are they a little more practical, which leads perhaps to the next question, which is, at what point are they going to become aggressive toward Israel, our closest democratic ally in the Middle East? Well, you know, I think that uh, we should hear Vietnam's response on this because he follows what happens inside Iran more closely than I do, for sure. Um, I will say that, look, I mean, we need to recognize that in Iran, you have uh, absolutely a sort of uh, authoritarian regime, which, like so many authoritarian regimes, um, persecutes its own people and represses its own people. So this is not just a regime that has a problem with the United States. This is a regime who, by its behavior, seems to see its foremost threat as, as its own people. Um, and therefore, it shouldn't necessarily surprise us um, when the regime is making decisions which may serve regime interests but are, but are seemingly counter to the interests of the people, the national interests, why would you know, the regime endure such economic uh, cost uh, for the sake of this nuclear program? It's, I think it's because of the regime's uh, desire to protect itself, to protect its ideology and so forth, um, not because it's necessarily serving the interests of the people of Iran. And you could probably say that about a good deal of their activity in the region uh, as well. And uh, as, I, as I noted uh, to, to someone a little earlier in this discussion, it's important, I think, that we maintain that distinction between the, the Iranian regime and the Iranian people. Because in democracies, you can say the interests of the state, the interests of the people should, uh, at least in theory, coincide a good deal. When, you're, when you start talking about autocratic regimes, obviously those things can drift apart. Um, and what the principal uh, and the agent um, want aren't necessarily the same things. Um, but let me let me defer to Behnam on this because it is something that he follows more closely than, than I do. And there is that Israel question in there. Yeah. Uh, Mike, did you want to tackle Israel first? Uh, the the component like the aggression, the foreign repression, foreign aggression, domestic repression, or go for it. How, how, how worried should Israel be? Is the question because Israel could certainly retaliate and bring a firestorm down on Iran. Well, I mean, Mike was very kind to refer to me there, but he put his finger right on the money, which is the, the sharp cleavage or, or the chasm between national interest and regime interest uh, in Iran. And it's not something that was unique to the Ahmadinejad era, which uh, just for the audience was from 2005 to 2013 uh, in Iran. Basically, every president under the current Supreme Leader has gotten two terms in office, and it's likely that the current president will also get a second term, but he was just uh, elected, or shall we say selected, uh, earlier this summer, uh, earlier in June 2021. Um, but your analogy is very interesting. Uh, a suicide bomber or, or someone who had a, a suicide vest. Or what, what was the analogy, Greg? Uh, that, was... that he was a suicide bomber with a nation strapped to his chest. Uh, okay, I have, I, have, I have a more interesting analogy rooted in, in British uh, TV from the 80s. It's from a, this a satire show I love called Blackadder where they're talking about someone who's running for parliament in, 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 uh, in, in one of these uh, Victorian era elections, quote unquote, where he says he's more than a monkey who's been put into a suit and strategically shaved. <laughs> so I, I think for the Ahmadinejad era, you know, he wanted to draw a sharp contrast. He literally went to the UN, insulted the UN, uh, you know, said what he said uh, at Columbia University, 
uh, acted the way he did because he actually was content to present that rogue face of the Islamic Republic saying no, that rejectionist front. And that had real world implications for Israel because much of Iran's foreign and security policy, regardless of the president at the helm, is not set by that president. It's set by those more concrete ultra hardline elements, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the Expediency and Discernment Council, uh, you know, the Supreme National Security Council, and of course the Supreme Leader and the Office of the Supreme Leader, uh, which you know the Islamic Republic has really had only two Supreme Leaders, and this uh, second one, uh, Khamenei, uh, has really institutionalized that position and, and made a real bureaucratic intelligence and security apparatus tied to his office, uh, and continued, if not accelerated, uh, the anti-Semitic and anti-Israel policies he inherited from his predecessor, who was the founding father of the Islamic Republic, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, was his name. So, you know, if you are in Israel, you are worried. You're worried on, on multiple fronts. The regime has proxies almost uh, encircling Israel, if not entirely, on the land borders. You have Hamas, you have the Assad regime, uh, uh, you have uh, Lebanese Hezbollah, we talked about already, up to the north. Uh, you have a Iranian quest to carve out a land corridor, you know, a contiguous piece of territory from Iran's own territory into, into Iraq, into Syria, and out into Lebanon, projecting more power that way. You have increased cyber capability. There's basically a secret cyber shadow war going on as we speak between Israel and Iran. You have Iran, uh, you know, procuring, producing, and proliferating these systems like ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and drones, which is transferring to proxies right up to Israel's doorstep. Uh, and you have really Iran intent on this death by a thousand cuts approach against Israel at the same time that it is ramping up its nuclear program. And, you know, M Mike knows he's been tracking this longer than I have, acting on threats that the regime made that it was uncomfortable acting on a decade ago that it is comfortable acting on today. And that's why that current constellation of power is very important in Iran, because in 2011, uh, Iran's leaders talked about enriching uranium to 60% purity. You know, 20% and above is considered highly enriched. 90 plus percent is, you know, the ideal weapons grade. 60%, you know, people talk about it being able to use to fuel or propel uh, uh, nuclear reactors on subs. You know, Iran doesn't have nuclear subs. It has these electric subs and only three of them really um, that they got from the Russians in the 90s. So Iran in April, 2021, felt comfortable acting on a threat it made in 2011-2012, about 60% enrichment. And that just tells you about the mindset of the current cast at the helm. So if you are Israel, you see all of that, plus, of course, the increasing domestic appetite for an American withdrawal from the region, uh, you will have to worry. And in fact, that is why the Israelis are worried. Mike. Okay, Claire is here with questions from people who are watching. I'm going to ask you each before that, for a 30-second answer, no more, to what is not a simple question. As Americans, how scared should we be if things don't work out in the talks? Michael. Well, look, I'll, I'll tell you, any, I mean, the, the most significant threat, in a sense, that the United States can face, or that any country can face, would be a nuclear-armed adversary. And so we, the United States has worked for decades and decades to try to halt nuclear proliferation, especially um, to states like Iran and North Korea and so forth. So um, it, it is uh, something that we in Washington worry about a lot because this is something that threatens America directly. This isn't sort of, uh, you know, a kind of uh, obscure or sort of uh, abstract foreign policy concern that we're talking about. On the other hand, uh, I would say that uh, I do still believe that it is within our capability as the United States um, to prevent nuclear proliferation, whether it's in Iran or elsewhere, um, with the right policies, you know, if we're willing to use that sort of uh, full set of tools that we have in concert um, to try to stop it. Um, and so we should certainly worry, um, but let's also have a little bit of confidence, I would say, as the United States, that we can do something about it. Ben Om, do you have 10 seconds to add to that? Uh, strongly second everything Mike said. And, and if we think that if we shouldn't worry or if we shouldn't act and we can just pivot away from the problem, uh, you know, I think Russia and China would be intent to inflate the Iran threat as we think we can leave the region. So uh, this isn't a, a very neat and parsimonious issue where we can say, uh, we're going to focus on China. Uh, when there's a will, there's a way. And I think that's what the Islamic Republic has really shown for the past four decades. Thank you. Claire? Benham, you've brought up these talks that are taking place in Vienna. So I'm wondering if you could just give our audience a sense of what exactly is going on there? We just heard that Iran's 
top negotiator returned to Tehran for consultations. I've also heard that the Iranians won't talk directly to the United States. They're talking to us through the Germans, the Brits, and the French. So can you give us an idea of what's been going on for weeks and has anything come out of these talks so far? You know, I can only give you a 50,000 foot given that I'm sadly not in Vienna. Uh, but, you know, in short, this is a continuation of indirect diplomacy, six rounds of which happened under the current president's predecessor, uh, Hassan Rouhani, from April to June uh, with the Biden administration. Uh, round seven began on November 29th. You could say there was a round seven and a half or a round eight that was just picked up and there's a suspension now. Uh, but that round seven and eight, uh, there were real questions of how much of the predecessor's negotiating policy would the current Iranian president inherit? Would they like to revise pre-existing proposals, pre-existing proposals which exist in the Persian press but don't really exist here uh, in kind of open source English language press? Uh, and how serious is Iran when it says, you know, first the U.S. must remove all sanctions, then we'll talk about its nuclear issue. So there's real questions about phasing, you know, that incongruence Mike talked about, as well as, of course, uh, will Iran want to offer less and settle for receiving more, given that it kind of feels comfortable in this concede uh, less and threaten more approach. So, uh, you know, it, it's still a, a TBD and there may be talks that resume in late December after Christmas. So what I'd like to do is combine questions from both Bob and Lauren. Bob is asking basically what, what are Tehran's leadership goals? And Lauren is asking something similar. If Iran is determined to act like a less hostile, more normal major middle power, um, how might that come into being say over the next five to 10 years? Michael, can we start with you? Sure. Well, you know, the, in terms of the regime's goals, um, you, you'll hear different takes on this and people will sort of add more or less, but I would say the fundamental goal is uh, the survival of the regime, the survival of the system uh, in Iran, uh, which is not so dissimilar from, uh, say, how North Korea approaches uh, its goals and so forth. And um, you see the regime pursuing a strategy both domestically and in foreign policy to accomplish that. Um, and there's no doubt that, you know, for whether it's North Korea, Iran, or any other state like them, having nuclear weapons, uh, they probably, they see as something which would help ensure their survival. Not, not necessarily ensure just Iran's own defense, but ensure the survival of this particular regime. Um, there are, there are other goals I'm sure that Iran has, but my guess is that this is sort of the main motivation that they have. Um, and then the second part of your question, Claire, I'm sorry, was? Well, if they were, Lauren is wondering if they were to become, let's say, a more normal middle power, what might that look like and how might that happen over the next five to 10 years? It's hard to imagine that happening over the next five to 10 years without some pretty significant political change in Iran. And the, the reason I say that is that, um, again, this is a regime that has adopted a very particular strategy um, towards its region, uh, towards a region that surrounds it, I should say. It's not Iran's region. Um, it has, instead of um, establishing good bilateral relations with neighbors, you know, engaging in various forms of diplomatic or economic cooperation, uh, it has chosen instead to try to keep its neighbors essentially unsettled um, in order to sort of keep them focused on problems away from Iran's borders. And so you see, for example, Iran um, fomenting uh, trouble in Lebanon, building up a militia in Lebanon, Hezbollah, uh, as something that it can use and, and often does use to threaten Israel. You see Iran providing quite recklessly weapons to the Houthi militia in Yemen, so that the Houthi militia can pose a greater danger to Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia's southern border. Um, and we have seen, as Bethna mentioned, Iran also engaging in politics at the sort of sub-national level, trying to cultivate proxies and partners around or over the heads of national governments. That behavior is obviously not what we would consider normal or acceptable um, from one state when dealing with other sovereign states. Um, and for Iran to change that, I think would be unlikely under the, the current system, because it's a choice which is not simply a, a policy choice that could uh, they could abandon uh, 
in an instant, but it's a choice which arises from domestic factors. And Beth and I have talked about some of those. Um, so I don't think that that's really a very strong prospect in the next five to 10 years, again, without some pretty significant political dislocation. And that itself um, could give rise to instability and other, other risks and dangers um, as it happened. Thank you. Mike Benham, would you be comfortable addressing just some understanding over the economics of how does a country survive really crushing sanctions and, and still keep going? And Lauren's wondering, you know, what are their major exports and who are they exporting to? This is uh, an excellent question, and it's as much of a policy question as it is an intelligence question. I'm sure the U.S. government has its own sets of answers, and if it doesn't have, it's trying to hone down these answers. So I'll, I'll do my best to be as accurate as possible, uh, but knowing full well that there are still a lot of known unknowns or no, unknown knowns, whichever formulation is, is uh, more apt here. So in essence, it's an oil-based economy, but it's not only an oil-based economy. The multilateral sanctions uh, that when Trump restored them in 2018 became unilateral, Iran did not think that they would be as crushing and as effective. And that's why Iran did not begin to violate the nuclear deal in May 2018. It did so in May 2019, once the facts kind of necessitated that it kind of develop a response to this crushing economic pain. Uh, while oil exports by Iran were certainly not zeroed out, they were dropped. So what Iran did was engage in ship-to-ship -ship transfers, basically have oil that it continued to produce because these wells are still active, these facilities are still active, store them on its tankers abroad, get the tankers out to see international waters, and transfer them into other uh, tankers uh, that you know it did not mind getting. They did not mind. Uh, who the flag bearer of that tanker was, and shipping them to buyers, you know, many of whom, according to the Treasury Department, were in East Asia that didn't mind tolerating this lower level of risk because it was harder to track, harder to get a whole chain of attribution. So it still got its major export, which is petroleum, onto the market. Uh, at the same time, as the U.S. tightened the noose on Iran 2019-2020, uh, not just against oil, but against even storing Iranian oil, a whole series of metals and the downstream kind of petrochem sector, petroleum product sector, uh, Iran took more advantage of the chaos in its region uh, to do money laundering, to do overland uh, uh, exports of oil, to disguise Iraqi, Iranian oil as Iraqi, certainly taking advantage of a whole series of jurisdictions of uh, you know, weak central authority and jurisdictions of money laundering concern. Those are technical <laughs> treasury department terms. Uh, to get more business. So for instance, uh, Oman, Malaysia, UAE uh, were big importers of petrochemicals in the year like 2019 or 2020, for instance. Uh, Iraq is likely a major sanctions busting hub. Afghanistan, both pre-Taliban and during Taliban is likely a huge jurisdiction. Iran got around the multilateral sanctions from 2010 to 2012 uh, by you know, creating a whole series of shell companies in Turkey. Uh, I would certainly look there. There's a whole web of banks, businesses, bad actors that basically help the regime generate enough revenue so that this sanctions game, which is in many ways a Russian nesting dolls kind of game, can't keep up with. And the, the success story for American sanctions is not just to force an end to the nuclear program, but it's to make this Russian nesting dolls operate slower and less effectively. And you're basically trying to get your adversary to do the same things it's doing with less revenue. And that's akin to wrestling somebody with one arm tied behind their back. Thank you. This will probably be our last question. I'm gonna start with Michael and then Benham, if you wanted to chime in. We hosted a program just a few weeks ago on Lebanon and our panel talked about the issue of corruption being just one of the things that's really at the root of Lebanon's problems right now. And their, the government's inability to deliver services to their people. And of course, we saw with Afghanistan government falling late this past summer, um, also uh, accusations that staggering corruption was part of the downfall of that regime. You don't hear about corruption so much with Iran. Is Iran, you know, relatively free of corruption? Or you know, is the government able to keep a lid on that? Or is it just something that is just part of the mix there that we're just not hearing about? Um, no, Iran's not free of corruption. Uh, Iran also has significant problems with corruption. Um, 
And one of the reasons that uh, Iran did not uh, experience in the initial years of the JCPOA, when it was in operation, 2016, 2017, why it didn't experience the economic windfall that it hoped to is because sanctions are really only one obstacle or have been only one obstacle to Iran attracting, say, foreign trade and investment. Uh, there are other obstacles. Corruption is a significant one. Um, the regime uh, is, is not just involved in politics and security, it's also heavily involved in the nation's economy. And, and you'll see, for example, the Revolutionary Guard Corps, which most of you will have heard of in the context of you know, uh, sort of sponsoring militias uh, in other countries in the Middle East, is also heavily involved in Iran's um, uh, private sector, which we have to put in air quotes, um, because of course, those are, that's a government entity that's crossing the boundary from the public to the private sector. So, so these are problems as well. And, and the reality is that there is, even with total sanctions relief, um, Iran would still um, uh, find a lot of struggles economically because of these problems of corruption and financial mismanagement uh, and so forth. And so absolutely not. Iran is not free of these problems. There's very heavy involvement in the private sector by the Re Revolutionary Guards and other public sector actors um, uh, with ties to the regime. Um, and it's a big obstacle to um, even, you know, post uh, a good nuclear deal, uh, Iran uh, really morphing into a more, more vibrant and more successful place. Thank you. Benham, did you want to add something to that? Uh, Michael hit the nail right on the head, but just a, a brief footnote. There are, you know, the Revolutionary Guard owns banks, businesses, uh, different iterations of Iranian presidents has refer have referred to the Revolutionary Guards as our smuggling brothers because they're engaged in so many smuggling operations. Um, you know, they mean that both with praise and with derision. You know, the IRGC operates not just necessarily their own ports, but their own jetties, like smaller ports where they bring in things from cash to precious metals to even drugs. The U.S. has even designated, I think, an IRGC official with a kingpin designation. That's a drug trafficking related designation. Uh, what the U.S. has not used and I think does have ample room for given the corruption moving forward is the Magnitsky laws. And this is something, you know, Mike talked very neatly about multilateral pressure against Iran and perhaps what we might see in 2022. You know, I think Australia, the UK, the EU and the US all have different versions of Magnitsky laws. And I think uh, towards a more multilateral pressure strategy would be targeting not just the regime's nuclear apparatus, but those engaged in corruption and governance issues and human rights abuses through the Magnitsky prism. So I think this is an area ripe for exploring in 2022. Thank well, you, I, Greg. I, I, I was going to hand it back to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Michael Singh, a senior fellow and managing director at the Washington Institute, and Benam Taliblu, senior fellow at Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. I thank you both. And what I take from what you've told us in this hour of no easy answers is that there may be a parallel to the pandemic. We're scared about the possibilities. We don't know where things are going. But at the same time, there's a genuine possibility, however slight, that someday we might look back and say this too has passed. Thank you again. Claire? Benham, Michael, Greg, thank you all for joining us this evening for this fascinating discussion for everyone at home. Thank you for joining us. As I mentioned in my introduction, we've unfortunately had to postpone our next two in-person events and we will reschedule those later in the spring when conditions allow for in-person events. So our next program is on Tuesday, January 11th, and we'll be looking at special districts, the most local of local governments. Good night, everyone, and thank you. Thank you. Take care, thank you so much. Thank you.